I have a couple of things I wanted to touch on, but even before I get to any other issues, I want to talk about the Supreme Court, and I know you do as well. The dismantling of government that can be done by the courts is a profound threat to some valuable institutions of government. You may feel, uh, as a listener or viewer, as though government is overbuilt and there's too much, uh, you know, middle management, whatever you might feel about these sort of um, uh, lumbering government agencies. But to dismantle them completely can leave consumers, environment, uh, the environment itself, uh, uh, and environmental concerns uh, without any lifeguard on the beach. And I wonder if you could speak to what's happening at the Supreme Court right now, David Katz. Well, I'd be happy to. Um, and uh, the, the problem, as you say, is that people fall for this rhetoric, you know, get the government off our back. This idea that if you just reduce government, that somehow, you know, everyone will get along. And that's not what human history tells us. And that's not what the history of this country tells us. You know, we had the huge antitrust cases, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and all of that. We had, uh, you know, the steel monopoly. We had the oil monopoly. Um, and that was broken up actually by Republicans. So Republicans historically have gotten the idea that if we're going to have a capitalist system, we have to really rein in the capitalists. Uh, Adam Smith said, if you get three um, competitors together, they'll fix prices. Well, we have agencies that make sure they don't fix prices like the antitrust division, like the Federal Trade Commission. So this latest case has been brought by a manufacturer of these taser devices, and they want to take over a competitor, another taser uh, company, and they would have market power then over tasers, which the Federal Trade Commission is worried about. So the Federal Trade Commission starts proceedings. Now, these groups like the Federal Trade Commission, like the Environmental Protection Agency, um, maybe like the IRS, maybe like some other agencies, um, they have administrative hearings, which are kind of like courts. And if you don't like their rulings, Mark, then you go to the Court of Appeals. You don't go to the district court. You don't go running around the country trying to find a district judge who's going to be favorable to you. You know, the, uh, the right wingers do it. They do it down in Texas. They cherry pick a judge. Look at the way Trump went down the road and cherry picked that judge that uh, Patton I used to call loose cannon. Um, so you don't cherry pick a judge. You have to have these administrative proceedings. It sounds very boring. And then you go to the Court of Appeals. Well, people have said, wait a second. Suppose I want to argue that the Securities and Exchange Commission is illegally constituted. Suppose I want to argue that there's been a delegation of power um, by Congress, which didn't include what the Federal Trade Commission is doing to me. Can I go run to a district judge and say, oh, it's so unconstitutional, it's so unfair? And it looks like the Supreme Court is going to allow people to do that. Um, and that's a case out of the Fifth Circuit, out of the court, federal court that sits in Louisiana and Texas. They took it. It was argued uh, just to uh, just yesterday. It was argued just yesterday. And again, it looks like they're going to allow these challenges. Now, the attorneys say, isn't that great? People should be able to run to a federal court and complain about the violation of their constitutional rights. But it's going to be gamed. That's the problem. So who's going to be able to do it? Not you and me, not somebody under tax audit, probably, which I'm not. Um, but, you know, uh, the average person who thinks, well, wouldn't that be nice if I were a securities, uh, you know, analyst and the SEC wanted to suspend me and I wanted to argue it was unconstitutional or the members of the SEC somehow were not properly appointed. Shouldn't I argue these constitutional arguments? Shouldn't I be able to argue these structural arguments? But the reality is you and I cannot afford to do that. Who can afford to do that? All the big polluters, all the big monopolists and oligopolists. And so they will tie up the courts. They will, uh, they will athwart the work of these administrative agencies. And while it is true that you can make the argument, why should you have to go through administrative proceedings for three or four years before you finally go to the Court of Appeals and say, hey, wait a second, uh, these commissioners weren't properly picked. This uh, agency never had power over what I was doing. You and I are not going to benefit from this. The people who want to pollute and uh, monopolize that's who's going to benefit from it in the name of supposed liberty, in the name of getting the government off our back. Uh, it's so well stated. It, it really masquerades as uh, empowering people. But the reality is it's the new people, the new persons, as also uh, specified by Supreme Court ruling, which is 
uh, corporate America. So big money corporations as people can now take on government. And uh, that's so well described. Uh, I wanted to ask you also about this. Um, now, there's I don't think this is ever going to happen. But the notion that you could disqualify Donald Trump from seeking re-election to the presidency or any other office uh, based on the 14th Amendment. And that would suggest that Donald Trump had engaged in the January 6th insurrection, you know, had a role in it. And as a result, because as a participant in insurrection, you are accepted from running for office, uh, he's not eligible. So this isn't a theoretical thing. Crew, the, uh, what is it? The, what is it? It's an acronym for um, uh, the Center for uh, uh, something with ethics. And I, anyway, Crew, they do a lot of ethics is definitely the E. Um, they're bringing this, uh, they're bringing this suit. I wonder if you could just remark on that. Again, I think like it feels like a Hail Mary type thing, but nonetheless, it's out there. Well, it's a Hail Mary that I think they should throw, uh, and I think that they will, and they seem like a very a competent uh, organization, a very public-interested organization. But the distinction, and there is a commissioner down there in, I think, New Mexico, but he is not in the same situation as Trump. He's a fellow who got caught in the middle of the insurrection, got arrested at or inside the Capitol, uh, got convicted in a federal district court of basically acts that constitute insurrection. And so having been convicted in a federal court, he still would not resign. Uh, and so another judge, or maybe that judge, uh, then disqualified him. So you can see the hurdles that crew is going to have when it comes to Trump. Trump isn't a, a you know, under finance a commissioner somewhere um, who got slapped down, uh, convicted. Uh, he would fight uh, crew every inch of the way um and he'd spend a huge amount of money on it because the remedy would be disqualifying him from running for president and some court would have to first uh find if not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt at least by something like clear and convincing evidence that trump had participated in the insurrection of course while you and i think from everything that the january 6 committee has brought out and from the record that of course he did he incited that he was the worst offender in the January 6th insurrection, you know, he wasn't caught there and he'll have a lot of defenses. And so I think to get to first base, he'd have to be convicted or found by some federal judge, at least by clear and convincing evidence to have participated in the insurrection and been an insurrectionist. If they could get to that first base, uh, then sure, they could get around the bases pretty quickly because someone convicted of insurrection uh, is disqualified under the 14th Amendment. Oh, the last thing is that they would have to show that this was the type of insurrection. If you put on a vigorous defense, they would say the insurrection means the Civil War. It means that. It doesn't mean this kind of rioting. And there would be a big argument over the historical record of what insurrection meant and what they did in the late 1800s. It would be a fascinating case. I don't think, like you do, that it would result in an order disqualifying him before the 2024 election. But what's fascinating to me is what you're talking about, and this is why you're such a great a legal mind, is that the way that they would slice that case legally, it can be done in so many ways. It would be dragged out. And this is why the courts... Uh, also to your answer and response are so critical. I was making the point earlier that, you know, you need the presidency and the Senate, in my judgment now, to really influence, not, notwithstanding all the investigations and revelations from January 6th committee and, and the way impeachment proceedings can be launched in the House, et cetera. But what I really think is shaping America in uh, the short, medium and long term future is power over the courts. And you just explain why. I mean, in, in the appellate process and in all the different judgments that would have to be reached before you could even accept Trump or maybe even other public officials from uh, re-election. The courts are critical. Well, I said this during the Mueller investigation. I said this on CNN and, you know, they kind of uh, were disappointed. Um, but, you know, it's going to be the people who save this democracy. And yes, the courts are going to help. Uh, but to wait for Mueller you know, to be the miracle man and to wait for some judge to be the miracle man or woman who says, no, Trump, you can't run and his name will be stricken from the ballot, you know, state after state. It's not going to happen that way. He has to be beaten at the polls. He has to be beaten in the court of public opinion. People who even think that he's got the right message on something, I think, are coming around to saying he's not the right messenger. The example I always gave, the people who thought he was going to stand up to China and bring back jobs from China. As soon as uh, his daughter got some licenses and patents over there in China, uh, he was going to, you know, he was going to throw down the cards and say, wow, 
that meant meant a lot more. It is it is heart of hearts. Trump was going to say that meant a lot more to me, the family getting some privileges in China, than bringing back any jobs from China for you, the working man and woman of America. He had uh, Trump an effective. I, I say this. I mean, he had a smack talking. Uh, effective working man, again, using the catchphrase uh, appeal. But as you've just alluded to, he was a, an utterly a self-absorbed and self-serving president. Uh, are there, are there, you know, there are redistricting cases that are coming up before the court. You know, there are, uh, there are a number of cases that do relate to elections that are coming up before the court. Do you feel as though the court will essentially allow the states to Ah, uh, get away with some of the extreme redistricting that we've seen in North Carolina, for example. The courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, will allow um, this gerrymandering that goes gerrymandering that goes on. Um, there was a case a few years ago where it looked like they might, you know, uh, have standards for gerrymandering. Um, you know, I, I think soon there may be a district in California that runs up and down the coast for hundreds of miles. And of course, the gerrymander is like the salamander, right? Um, it's the idea that you take a little bit here, you take a little bit there. And before you know it, there are states that vote Democratic in the presidential election uh, that have 10 representatives and seven or eight are Republicans. Now, there are some states, I think, like Maryland, that the Democrats gerrymander, but it's nothing on the scale and it doesn't have the scope. And of course, people are really getting sick and tired of it. You know, in blue states and in big cities, you know, we're starting to have rotten boroughs, they called it in uh, Great Britain. Uh, we're starting to have places that have really depopulated, but they still have a huge amount of power. And when they're strung together in this gerrymandered way, they have outsized power. That's the House. And then in the Senate, of course, you have all these states, you know, North Dakota and South Dakota have like, what, uh, 20th the population of California, but twice the electoral impact because they have four senators and we only have two. That's a structural problem I don't think that we can solve. But when it comes to doing something about gerrymandering, I don't think that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to do it. Uh, and it, it is a huge problem. I mean, you can organize and you can vote and that's what people ought to do. But it's just very frustrating. It's sort of like uh, the Democrats and the big cities, you know, never get to kick the football because it's so hard to kick the football when all of these tiny states, tiny populated states, um, you know, and, and they, you know, they thought if they divided the country mark geographically, it would kind of work out. And then California, you know, got to be such a huge state. And that was great. We joined the union. But we're so underrepresented. It's underrepresented. It's really frustrating. And gerrymandering just makes it worse than that in states like Wisconsin. You know, there was a fellow running for a governor in uh, Wisconsin, I think it is, is quoted as saying, if I win, the Republicans will never lose in Wisconsin again. And that's not just braggadocio. That's the fact that they will have gerrymandered the state so effectively that if they also have a Republican governor in Wisconsin, um, it's going to be very, very hard to win, even though the will of the people, even though the majority of people want to have a democratic government, the Republicans will keep power in the state and they'll keep power in the Congress because they will have so effectively gerrymandered the state. Wisconsin is a great example of what you're talking about and a, a power grab and a power grab for all time in the future. Uh, people are saying in the uh, chat Why don't you that just we, text should, it? we should ding gerrymander. Gerrymander, we use it so much, we don't ding it, so uh, we don't. However, I will... Uh, I will ding uh, braggadocio. So uh, he, that was very uh, well done by um, uh, David Katz. Very nice job. Uh, I, um, I I think you've touched on something, and I, I, I uh, as with our last couple of minutes with David Katz, I, I, I feel as though we really should open up the hood on American elections and American representation and American government, and it's going the other way. You were talking about the underrepresentation of California. I see the underrepresentation of many Americans. So look at Washington, D.C. There are 20 states that have a, a lesser population than Washington, D.C. These are American citizens in Washington, D.C. and They don't have representation in Congress that means anything. Same is true of the people of Puerto Rico. I mean, this is, it's scandalous. And the only reason it exists that way is because of politics. Because if you gave the people of Washington, D.C. real representation in Congress, it would be a democratic state. Uh, likewise, probably Puerto Rico, uh, you know, when Hawaii entered the Union, I think that was in about 1960, it was paired with Alaska. 
the idea being that Alaska would be Republican forever and Hawaii would be Democratic forever. So you'd maintain that balance. And of course, in American history, you know, we had that with the slave states and the free states. Uh, it was one of the things that led to the, the Civil War, besides the Dred Scott decision. Um, that trying to maintain that balance. And then uh, when Lincoln won, they thought, well, there was no more balance like that. And the South seceded, you know, before he was even inaugurated, they seceded. David Katz, I love having you in. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing some time with us. Uh, I'd love to unpack the election a little bit with you maybe next week and also touch on the, the, the courts are going to be so much at the center of the election as well. As you we were saying, they're already rugby scrums of lawyers on both sides that are ready and willing to not only challenge election results, but defend election results. So will you please join us next week? I sure will. Can I, I sure will. Can I throw in one thing? When I was an assistant U.S. attorney, and this is back in the late 80s, we had this issue that people were being posted I had it for the government. I was one of the government watchdogs. Now these political parties are acting as watchdogs too. The Department of Justice, the assistant U.S. attorneys around the country, the Civil Rights Division is watching this election very carefully. But what they were doing then was they were sending people with uniforms down there. Uh, and the idea was to intimidate Latino voters to make them think, oh, this person could be from the, the INS or could be asking some inconvenient questions. And uh, we had that matter. And they're still doing that. You know, these uh, security task forces at polling places. So everyone should go out and vote. Everybody should be unintimidated. Nobody is there to give you a hard time about your immigration status. Everybody get out there today and vote. Uh, well said, sir. David Katz, everybody. Thanks, David. We'll talk next week. So cool to have David Katz on the show.